All right, we'll now take up item 3.3, actions related to the regional public safety interoperable broadband uh, system. Let me introduce this item by explaining why we're here with such uh, short notice. Uh, we're dealing with a request from Alameda County Sheriff Gregory Ahern to let him know in writing by the close of business Wednesday, that would be tomorrow, if the city of San Jose intends to participate in the Bay Web project, which is a regional broadband project for public safety. It's designed to provide broadband for interoperable public safety communications and to cover the entire 10 county Bay Area region. In August, Motorola received a $50.6 million grant from the federal government uh, to start the build of the Bay Web project in the Bay Area with plans to use public safety communications infrastructure already in place and to build on it. Uh, there's a staff report uh, that's been circulated to the council that outlines the history and the concerns that San Jose staff and, and I have uh, raised uh, to date. Uh, but the decision to join in the Bay Web project is, or not, is a, is a big decision, and one that neither I nor the police chief nor the city manager could or should have made without a vote of the city council. So that's why we're putting this in front of the council. Uh, Sheriff Ahern has been asked by NTIA, National, whatever, Department of Commerce, NTIA, I'm, it's, I'm sure there's a, a long name for the acronym, but has been asked to uh, get uh, letters of intent from the participating agencies, and he was given a short schedule to do that. So we're trying to accommodate that by putting in front of the council uh, today, notwithstanding the fact we have quite a few other things on the agenda. Uh, but uh, we, uh, he's agreed to wait until tomorrow for a written response. The Rules and Open Com Government Committee put this on the agenda, waive the sunshine requirements uh, in order to get it in front of the council until so we can give uh, Sheriff Ahern a timely response. And so we've uh, offered Sheriff Ahern a chance to come in and tell us uh, what he's asking us for and why, or anything else that he cares to comment on. And I don't think Sheriff Ahern is here. I think Bill McCammon is going to take the lead on presenting it. So if you'd come on down. And uh, we'll turn this over to you for a presentation. Bill is uh, Bill McCammon's Executive Director of East Bay Regional Communications System Authority. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council, and I appreciate the opportunity to address you today on this subject, which we think is extremely important. And um, the way I found myself here today is that um, Sheriff Ahern has been very concerned, as I'm sure you are when you read through the staff report, that probably the most glaring deficiency in this whole grant process is the fact that there has been no formalized governance structure. Sheriff Ahern is committed to creating that governance structure and invited the region to participate. I was asked to facilitate that process because we successfully implemented joint powers authority between Alameda and Contra Costa County and we currently have 36 member agencies and we're building a communication system for the two counties. So I have had some experience in developing um, governance. I would like to make a couple of comments about things that are included in the staff report, not as criticisms, but just to elaborate on those a little bit and then speak to the efforts that Sheriff Ahern has put forward to try and bring this all back together again because clearly it has, um, it's scattered. Um, initially, the NTIA grant through BTOP was uh, established to accomplish three primary goals. The first was to increase community access to broadband. The first uh, round of grants went out to actually improve broadband access in rural communities. The second round included another goal, and that was to provide public safety access to advanced broadband capabilities on secure networks, something that a number of us in the region, including Chief Moore, have been actively pursuing at the national level. And third was to provide economic stimulus through the creation of jobs. Um, and promote public-private partnerships. And, and one of the things that's important to note about that is that this issue of the stimulus funds came with a very short time frames in terms of implementation. They want the grant completed within three years, and so they really wanted to get things moving quickly to stimulate the economy. The UASI undertook a process earlier in the year and invited a number of vendors to participate in that process. Motorola was selected, and I know there's some question about whether that, that process was a competitive process. Um, Cal EMA reviewed that process and came back and made a, or a finding that it actually exceeded standards for procurements for this type of a, a relationship. The grant was awarded to Motorola. It's a $50.5 million grant with a $21.9 million match that Motorola is going to put up. It consists of 193 sites that are owned by local jurisdictions within the 10 Bay counties. And the purpose of the grant is to create a community access broadband network in conjunction 
conjunction with that, a public safety network for, for broadband. Again, I mentioned it has a three-year time frame in terms of implementation. There's some question, there's a recommendation in the staff report about possibly going back to NTIA and having them reallocate those funds to local jurisdictions. It's very clear from NTIA's perspective that Motorola is the grantee and that there's no ability to change that. And if, in fact, the Bay Area does not um, go through with this grant, the money would put, be put back to the Treasury. We've had conversations with Larry Strickling, who's the Undersecretary of Communications for NTIA, and he's reiterated that point. Um, NTIA, as the mayor said, is also very interested in engaging the support of the local agencies within the 10 Bay counties. And so that was why we put forward the letter of intent, was to gauge that interest. It is not financially binding in any way. It was just to gauge the interest of local jurisdictions. There's another issue that's brought up in the report about uh, interoperability and the fact if we're partnering with Motorola, we're going to end up in a situation like we had with some of our older proprietary voice systems where we wouldn't have interoperability. And that is really far from the case. The LTE 4G technology, which is proposed for the system, has to meet an international standard, which is a 3GPP standard that requires interoperable devices that work on all these networks. In addition, the FCC adopted an order on December 10th that established a technical framework to ensure interoperability of the networks to ensure that the early builders, as the Bay Area would be if the Bay Area goes forward, would ensure that there's interoperability built into that network. Related to Sheriff Ahern's role as the executive sponsor, when this whole grant possibility was rolling out early in the year, there was a lot of support from the Bay Area. The three mayors from the core cities were involved with letters of support. There were elected officials that were involved with letters of support. And they needed somebody to sign for the region. Sheriff Ahern stepped up as that executive sponsor, believing that he was supporting the interests of the region moving forward. Never that he was going to obligate agencies within the region to anything, but just to facilitate the process moving forward. So he did sign the grant as the executive sponsor. Since the grant was awarded, um, Sheriff Ahern has worked to bring together the region so that we could form a governance which was um, sorely lacking. We formed a technical advisory group that has representatives from the Bay counties that are working with Motorola to outline the technical requirements of, of the grant itself. And we're moving forward to try and formalize a formal governance structure so that we can move forward in this relationship. Um, the letter of intent that was proposed was something that we did with our JPA to gauge the interests of cities to participate in this. And that, that was all the letter of intent was for. The NTIA, as it was mentioned, is very interested in understanding what cities are in and what jurisdictions are in for this process. Um, I want to be very clear that no financial commitments were made by Sheriff Ahern on behalf of the region. Um, the governance structure is where the financial commitment will be developed in the form of a build, own, operate, maintain agreement. That will be negotiated by the members of this governance structure with the vendor. And then it would take a council action or a board of supervisors action from each agency to ratify that agreement and their participation in that. So as, it, as all this relates to the recommendations that are put forward by your staff, um, we recommend that you uh, execute the letter of intent. It is not binding in any way financially to the city, but it's gauging your interest in moving forward. But we recommend that you execute that with conditions. And the conditions are that the governance group adopt those guiding principles that were proposed by your staff. Um, I'm in total support of everything your staff included in those guiding principles. And I think as a region, if we're going to be successful, those have to be included as guiding principles for the governance structure moving forward. Um, and in closing, I think this is an extremely uh, important and valuable opportunity that we hope doesn't slip away from us. I understand that there's a lot of angst and um, things haven't gone as they should, but I'm, I can tell you from Sheriff Ahern's perspective, he's committed to try and work through these issues and we'd like to have San Jose partner with us. And I'm here under Sheriff Lucia is here as well if there are any questions specifically for us. So thank you for your time. Thank you for taking the time to come in and make the presentation. Appreciate the time pressures that the sheriff is under to try to respond to the federal government. I think we'll have some presentation from our own staff at this point. Thank you. Um, as stated, the city has received a request from Alameda County Sheriff Ahern that the city execute a letter of intent to participate in the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program, or also referred to as BTOP. 
Our staff memo outlines the various concerns with respect to this request. And I just need to state early on that we are in support of the concept of interoperability for public safety communications. And we do understand the, but we do need to understand the impacts to the city before we formally execute a letter of intent to participate in BayWeb or BTOP. Specifically, we have tried to obtain critical information such as operational goals, system design, equipment site requirements, and most importantly, the fiscal impact to the city. Since we have not received that information, from a staff's perspective, it's very difficult for me to sit here today and professionally recommend that we sign and execute the letter of intent. Because we do support the concept of interoperability for public safety communication, we have developed policy alternatives for the City Council to consider. Um, and I'll just, I'll go over them very quickly. First, we are recommending that the city adopt a position of support for the concept of regional interoperability for public safety communication, and as stated, that with that come guiding principles. The guiding principles are fully documented in the report, and I'll, I'll just review them very um, quickly also. First is that public-private partnerships or any decision to procure a system be done with accepted government procurement processes and that the appropriate decisions be made by the appropriate governing bodies. That the critical information that I stated in, earlier and that's noted in the report be disclosed to the impacted public agencies. That the governing bodies adhere to good government principles, including the Brown Act and other principles noted in the report. And last, that the system be developed by using source equipment and true interoperability with the purchase of non-vendor specific equipment. And second, as already noted, that we, as yet another attempt to put this effort back on the right track, we have suggested that the City Council consider asking the NTIA to reallocate the funds to the Bay Area cities and counties. This request is very similar to what other regions are doing regarding BTOP dollars, although we do note that it's highly unlikely that, that we would successfully have that as an outcome. And we did also put that in the staff report. That concludes my comments. We're here. There's many of us here to respond to questions from a staff perspective. I do want to note that Santa Clara County staff is in the audience, and they can also bring the council up to date on their current status with respect to this request. I think that would be a good thing to do if, uh, I don't know who's here from the county, Emily Harrison, have, I think. We do have Emily Harrison Because here. Uh, there was a letter on this topic from uh, county executive to Sheriff Ahern a few days ago. I'd like to know what the status of that is and the work that the county is doing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Emily Harrison, Deputy County Executive for the County of Santa Clara, representing Dr. Jeff Smith, our County Executive. Dr. Smith responded to the same um, short timeline in terms of the letter of intent from the Sheriff of Alameda County. He did so also expressing the support for the concept of a broadband project and saying that the County of Santa Clara would uh, participate provided um, certain things which have been called to our attention as being irregular in the process bringing us to this point were in fact not true. Um, the sheriff responded saying that the way in which we phrased our conditions, if you will, was not acceptable and therefore that the County of Santa Clara would be excluded from the BTOP project. That's the status as of today. We also were in close session with our board yesterday on this issue. Thank you. A couple of things to start with. First, uh, as noted by uh, Mr. McCammon, and has been noted by others, uh, I signed a letter of support for a BTOP project back in March. And let me just say that uh, had I known the facts, uh, I wouldn't have signed that letter of support. And uh, I believe that that letter of support uh, was received under false pretenses, because at the time, this was supposed to be a project of the Bay Area UASI, which is an organization that uh, we have helped form and we're on the approval, it's called the approval authority. Its job is to approve things. Uh, we're part of that. And this started out as a project that was going to be done by Bay Area Uwasi. As you have heard, it, it is no longer the case. It's now a project in which Sheriff Ahern is uh, the, the lead in whatever capacity for a, yet another organization. So uh, I'm just going to say that uh, if the council approves the staff's recommendation, I will uh, write a letter to the Department of Commerce rescinding my letter of support, and I think uh, that would be the appropriate thing to do. 
I have uh, in the preparing for this meeting and other things, I've sourced, I have talked to Larry Strickling of the NTIA, and he did say that uh, the decision by the federal government was final, and uh, that was that. However, uh, I think uh, if the facts are known to NTIA, they may have a different opinion. I've also talked to Secretary Locke, and I've corresponded with him as well. I've talked to the Assistant Counsel to the Inspector General of the Department of Commerce, and it is not clear that the Department of Commerce and NTIA is aware of all the facts in this matter, and they may well have a different opinion about their grant uh, and the grant process when those facts are known. My objective over the last few months that I've been involved is to first figure out what the facts are. Now, that has not been easy because uh, the Bay Area UASI staff was not forthcoming with the documents. We had to go to the federal government to request under Freedom of Information Act request to get the, uh, the grant application that Motorola submitted. And if you read that grant application, you'll see that uh, they are claiming that uh, this is a Bay Area UASI project, uh, that we have a governance model, that we're all organized and we're all behind it. Uh, but the project that I was in favor of is a different kind of a project with different management, different structure. And uh, I don't know why the uh, general manager of the UIC program decided to circumvent the approval authority in violation of our memorandum of understanding. I don't know why the Bay Area UIC manager and staff exceeded the scope of their authority. I don't know why they created a competing organization usurping the UIC approval authority's corporate opportunities, denying public review and scrutiny of the action, and denying the approval authority its right to vote on the deal. And we sit as a member of that approval authority. I don't know why they misrepresented the process and the partnership that we have in a local area to the Department of Commerce. Uh, I've asked those questions. I specifically asked Sher Sheriff Ahern those questions, and he doesn't have uh, a response to why. So we, we know a, a lot about what happened. We don't know a whole lot about why it happened. But I am interested in, in getting the facts uh, one way or the other, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but the question in front of us today is whether or not we want to sign <clears throat> the letter of intent that the sheriff has asked us to sign. So let me go to, back to my usual traditional approach, which is what is it and what's it going to cost us? What will it cost us to get into this arrangement uh, with Motorola uh, in a basically a single source deal? And does that make sense for the city of San Jose given the cost, let alone all these issues you have about governance and and uh, issues with the grant application process. So I, if staff could talk a little bit about what we know about the costs, and because uh, I think that's an, a relevant factor to consider. That may be a better question for Alameda County um, representatives to respond in terms of what they know. We have heard uh, different numbers flying around. We do know that the total project build out has been estimated between 400 to 600 million dollars what the city's portion or share around that um, we've heard estimates in the 160 up to the 180 million dollar range um, but we don't have anything in writing we don't have any cost calculations um, that's partly why it's it's very difficult to professionally recommend that we sign and execute the letter of intent is because these are all great answers that we just don't have ans answers to what about the elements of the cost we at least have the areas in which we think there will be a cost. As, We're going to have to build out some kind of physical infrastructure. Let, let me describe what I do know. There, there are some sites that are recommended uh, in the South Bay region. There are some sites noted in the grant application that are San Jose specific. The, um, as noted in the, in the Motorola video, there's about a 12 minute video as well as, as I believe in the grant application, there may be reference that local governments would make those sites ready and pay through their own uh, agencies the cost to, to have those sites ready so that they can um, be brought into the, this effort. That cost, we, we don't know. We hear some estimates. I think recently there's been an estimate around $4, $4 million. I'll, I'm looking to Michelle to confirm that. Um, Santa Clara County's preliminary estimate for the entire, for the, the few sites that are in Santa Clara County, including those in San Jose, is $4 million to get them shovel ready. This is despite the fact that the grant to the federal government said that the sites are all shovel ready. 
once we get the sites shovel ready and, and then can part, decide to participate, there are ongoing costs. Um, there's monthly costs to, to have a, a interoperability, almost like a subscription to, to ensure that uh, the, the equipment is working on a monthly basis. And I do hear different numbers, but I think it's um, 3,300 3, or something. Mayor Reed, uh, members of the council, Chris Moore, acting chief of police. Uh, one of the concerns, again, is we don't know what that subscription fee is. Right now, for our private commercial broadband service, we pay a flat fee that we've negotiated. Here, there would be negotiation, no negotiation, and the only term we get is about half of what you pay today. Well, I don't think they're contemplating half of what we pay, but we just don't have a number. They won't give us a number. That's part of our concern. There's a number of issues here that we just don't know the answers to, and every time we ask the question, we get we get the runaround. And the fact that one government entity is having to go through a, a Public Records Act request to receive information on a $50 million grant is just stunning to me. What about the cost of uh, equipment? Once you get the towers up and you get the, the infrastructure in, Who's going to sell us the handheld equipment or the portable equipment or the mobile equipment? Or Again, uh, depending on how these this, – this technology does not yet exist. And that's, we all have to recognize that, that the LTDX technology is just rolling out now. And on a national level, we're trying to do that. There are no devices today in the commercial market for public safety. Um, we don't know what those are going to cost. We don't know who's going to manufacture them. These are all unknowns. And the cost could be quite high. Actually, we're trying to drive the price down, but we just we just don't know. Now, to say uh, we're going to be responsible for it, we know that. That piece we know. We just don't know how much it's going to be. And is it contemplated that we're going to have to buy these devices from Motorola on a single source kind of a contract? I will say this. In, in uh, defense of Motorola, if you will, we are a Motorola shop and have been happy with Motorola's equipment over the years. It's been very, very expensive because it is such a small part of their market and it's very specialized and it costs us literally $5,000 per device per radio. We're hoping if we can get mass production that we can get that cost down, but the answer is probably yes. Don't know for sure yet. Well, just to ballpark it, if we currently pay $5,000 per radio, how many radios do we need? Well, if we equip every single one of our officers, I won't know what the number of our officers is until the end of the budget year, but right now at least uh, um, roughly about 1,200. And then if you talk about the fire department, you're adding on whatever the staffing of the fire department is. Potentially, if you have other critical infrastructure uh, or public works or other entities that might ride this network, that cost goes up from there. Okay. I'm going to give Mr. McCammon a chance to talk about the cost issue, as you suggested. <laughs> Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to step back to the letter of intent. Um, the letter of intent doesn't mean that you're joining and that there's financial obligations. All it means is, is that you're going to sit at the table with us while we determine what all of these issues are that haven't been determined. I'm not comfortable with the costs that we've been given from Motorola today, and I wouldn't advocate or recommend that anybody sign an agreement to move this system forward. What we're trying to do is assemble the people that are interested and then begin to assemble those costs. We're very concerned about the site preparation costs. The only way we can determine what those are is to have, there's a period in January where Motorola is going to come out and do site assessments of all of the interested parties to determine what those costs are so we can move forward. There's operational costs that need to be negotiated. That will be negotiated by the governance body that's created if we come together. All of those costs have to be determined before anybody would be expected to enter into an agreement that would obligate their jurisdiction to any funding at all. So the letter of intent obligates you to no funding. It was just a way to gauge the intent of the region to try and move this forward. As it relates to devices, um, Chief Moore is correct that the devices don't really exist yet. But the 3GPP standard that these systems are built on require that those devices be interoperable. So we're not locked into one vendor devices. There are many vendors that are making devices today that should come on the market recently. In fact, we were just back in Boulder and heard presentations from different developers that are building out those devices. So to be clear, Nobody is asking you to spend a dime today. All we want is you to come partner with us so we can determine what those costs are. And then there's going to be an opportunity to determine whether we think this is good for the Bay Area or not before anybody obligates one dime to do that. I hope that helps. Thank you. Any other questions on costs? As long as we're on the topic, staff. I, I just have a comment. Um, this, is, this began as a UASI initiated project, and the actions that led to the development of the BTOP application were um, put in place through UIC staff and at, at, to some extent on Project Cornerstone, and there's an outline in the staff report about it. 
there was approval action, approval authority action taken. The, the concept of um, removing BTOP from UASI approval authority action is interesting and it's unclear how we would be asked to participate in another effort when this by all senses really is a UASI project. It, it originated um, in terms of the pilot program as a UASI project that had formal approval action authority. The UASI staff staffed the BTOP program, program grant. Um, and so it's unclear to us why we would then have it removed and put into another governance structure when the dollars and, and um, actions are very much UASI originated. And so that is also just a, a philosophical issue and that I need to put out there because it's unclear why, why it would be removed and um, put into another governance, stru governance structure that does not exist. Mary, also, with respect to the original um, concept of a Bay Area system, the three large Bay Area cities that are in the UASI, that's Oakland, San Francisco, and San Jose, all came together and decided on their own in, to seek waivers to use the spectrum um, that is currently available for public safety. The basis upon which this BTOP grant was made was made contingent upon the use of that spectrum. Again, we are one of the three waiver cities that signed for that spectrum, and yet, as part of this reallocated money, San Jose have not been included in that pilot project cornerstone. Not only was the money reallocated without an approval authority vote, it's also being done on spectrum that specifically San Jose had been granted a waiver for, to use. Well, I do have some questions about that uh, 700 megahertz uh, waiver. I don't understand how Sheriff Ahern had the authority to deal away or get or grant or lease whatever happened with that that spectrum without San Jose's approval. I won't speak to it because I don't either, but I think perhaps somebody from Alameda County might be able to answer that question. Anybody want to answer that question on the 700 megahertz spectrum issue that was San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose were the three waiver cities? I, I can only speak from what I understand the reasoning was moving forward. And that was that the, the waiver was filed by the three cities on behalf of the region. And everybody felt that this grant was representing the region. And as part of that, we needed to apply to the PSST to have access to that spectrum for this grant to move forward. Sheriff Ahern, as the executive sponsor, submitted that application to use that spectrum that was filed for uh, clearly by the three cities, but on behalf of the region. If, if I may, on behalf of the region, again, the PSCC chairman who was granted that licensee was under the understanding that it went to the UASI and not to the region, a, a, an entity that was not defined. I should add that in, um, in the attached, one of the attach, attachment A, there is a letter that I had signed that references the, the waiver and that if the application were successful that the city of San Jose would in good faith enter into the requisite lease agreements with the Public Safety Spectrum Trust Corporation. What we subsequently learned is that documents were executed on behalf of a entity of which we really know nothing about that's referred to as the San Francisco Bay Area Urban Region, which entered into the, those lease agreements. I know Michelle wanted to add more. We've uncovered a number of documents um, that are on the FCC website. Um, including the lease agreement, including an experimental license, and including ex parte meetings between members of the UASC staff, Mr. McCammon, um, and the undersheriff, um, advocating for this lease to be um, granted to um, Sheriff Ahern for the BTOP project. Um, we were never notified as one of the three waiver cities, um, and, and the FCC's response was that there was a period for people to file complaints about the leases. Well, we were never notified that the complaint period had opened, so San Jose did not know that the lease was being entered into, nor did we know that we had a time frame in which to respond to the FCC, and we are one of the three parties to the waiver. During uh, the last few months, my staff and I have talked to Motorola, Alcatel, Lucent, Harris, AT&T, who were 
uh, potential vendors, uh, and I guess I'd have to say that well, Motorola was the one that ended up making the grant application. The others are, are none too happy about the process. And one of my concerns about the letter of intent is that it looks like a request for just for us to just let bygones be bygones on a, a, a process, a procurement process, which certainly doesn't meet our standards, and I can't believe, believe it meets San Francisco standards, that we just not worry about that anymore, and that we not worry about uh, misrepresentations uh, in the grant application uh, about this project. So I think we just got a letter in from Harris Microwave. I don't know if that's even been circulated. I just heard it, it came in today. I know there was an Alcatel-Lucent letter yesterday. And so my question is, if we sign on to this letter intent as requested by the sheriff, what are we doing with regard to those issues that have raised that these vendors have and that we have with the procurement process? Because I don't think we can just ignore the irregularities in that process. The um, next step to our understanding is that they, the uh, governance group with Alameda County would proceed with developing the governance structure and they would proceed with negotiations with Motorola. And you're right, Mayor, um, those past issues would be water under the bridge. And what about the $6 million? There's $2 million allocated to San Jose, $2 million to Oakland, San Francisco, I think. How did that money get spent? And uh, how does that fit into the the fifty million dollars? That's a that's a great question. There, that's true. There was a six million dollar allocation that the approval authority um, assigned two million dollars each to San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. That was action that was taken, but later, subsequently, the monies were reallocated by the UASI general manager for Project Cornerstone, which is the pilot program that begins BTOP. And uh, the mil $2 million that specifically to San Jose as well as the other cities was then reallocated over to Alameda County Sheriff's Office for Project Cornerstone. And our monies that were specifically assigned to San Jose were then reassigned to Sunnyvale and Santa Clara. There's been no formal action taken by the approval authority to um, redirect those funds. And we did uh, distribute a supplemental memo there that we received from the county and City of San Francisco's City Attorney's Office because there was action yesterday on the approval authority agenda to retroactively approve the UASI general manager's actions. Um, it was tabled because the meeting ran over, but the, it's, what's important here is that the attorney for San Francisco suggests that the action should have been formally adopted by the approval authority, um, which further suggests to us that that was an in, inappropriate action where the um, authority of the general manager was exceeded. Mr. Mayor, it's also my understanding that the, the, ma the management of that Cornerstone project actually now resides in that money, if I'm not mistaken, actually went to the East Bay Regional Communications System rep represented by Mr. McCammon. So I think he might be able to give us an update on where, if that money has been in fact been spent uh, or what its status is, if he's willing to say so. Mr. McCammon, would you like to talk about the, the reallocation? Thank you. I, I'm not prepared to comment on the actions that the UASI took about the reallocation because I don't know all the intricacies of that. We were approached by the, the Bay Area UASI to implement a pilot project. Um, the region was notified of this reallocation and the pilot project and there were sites that were asked for f from throughout the region to participate in this pilot project so we could begin to get some early testing of what one of these uh, 4G LTE networks would do. We offered, because of the timing of the procurement, to stand up and purchase the equipment with an understanding that it would be rolled into the BTOP program so that we would only retain ownership of it for a short period of time. There were 10 sites that were selected through a process that the UASI went through, four in San Francisco, three in Contra Costa County, one in the city of Oakland, and um, two in Santa Clara County. Cities of Santa Clara and Sunnyvale stepped up and said that they wanted um, to s put up sites. So we're in the process of building out that network now so that we can do some network testing. But again, those assets will become part of the regional assets once the governance is in place to manage those. Mr. Mayor, I just wondered, has that money been spent, that $6 million? 
Um, not all of it, but some of it has. But there's a core that has been purchased, which is like a master site, and the eNode Bs, which are actually the repeater sites, are in the process of being installed, and there are actually a few of them that are working now, and they're doing some preliminary testing. So some of those funds have been spent, but they've been dedicated to that project. So in a sense, they have, yes. Okay, anything else from the staff on the, the, the spending it's, piece? It's important to note, just so that the council has an understanding of the actions that were taken, um, between March 18th and um, early September of this year, all meetings of the UAC Approval Authority were canceled. And during the summer when the UAC Approval Authority meetings were canceled, the UAC staff um, actually went to the board of Mr. McCammon's organization and um, asked them to enter into this agreement to, to run the Cornerstone project. It's all there in the minutes of the organization. And they approved a contract, I believe it was in mid-July, uh, right around the time of a UAC approval authority meeting uh, that was canceled. Um, and the UAC uh, approval authority had an agenda item to retroactively approve this on the agenda uh, for yesterday as Deanna mentioned and um, unfortunately due to the length of the items on their agenda including um, discussion of whether or not to um, <coughs> do a more complete investigation of this project um, they they didn't get to that agenda item they also um, I should also note that the city of Oakland has filed a formal protest with UASI over the project cornerstone reallocation. Thank you. Councilmember Constant. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as the one of the city's two representatives on the Silicon Valley Regional Interoperability Authority Board, um, I've had an opportunity to learn a lot about the radio interoperability projects, not only in that capacity, but also in my capacity representing um, the city and all large cities on the National League of Cities Public Safety and Crime Prevention Committee, which has spent a considerable amount of time on um, the allocation of the D block and the 700 megahertz spectrum. I have to tell you, even with all of that um, information that I've been receiving over a period of time, all of this came to me as almost a complete and utter surprise. Uh, to know that this type of actions were being taken in the area without the city of San Jose even knowing about most of it, without the Silicon Valley Regional Interoperability Authority Board knowing anything about it, um, it's unconscionable that this type of action is being taken. And, and I know when it first came up, Pierre Luigi, who sits on the board with me, he and I looked at each other like, what, did we both fall asleep at a meeting? How did we not know about all this stuff? And it's just simply because it wasn't told to us. Um, I'm concerned about a lot of things. That The fact that we got this request and basically saying, drop everything you're doing and suspend all your rules and just give us this letter that says you agree, um, I think is unreasonable. I'm disappointed that Sheriff Ahern isn't here because there are a lot of questions that we have and um, I don't think it's an accident that he's not here because it, it's a continuance of a pattern of refusing to cooperate and refusing to answer questions to the city of San Jose. And quite frankly, um, I'm getting fed up with that. I look at these reports. I look at what our mayor has had to do, filing Freedom of Information Act requests, Public Record Act requests, and still not getting all the information that we need is ludicrous. What we're being asked to do is just to close our eyes and say, sure, go spend our money. Let us know if it turns out. That's It's unacceptable. I think that this is... Um, bordering on fraud, if not actually criminally fraud. We have a grant application that we know was completed that misrepresented the authority of a group that doesn't even exist, the San Francisco Bay Area Urban Region, that just someone just decided, hey, let's make up this name and start this project. 
it misrepresented the intent of the participants with us being one of them and as the mayor said completely mis represented his letter of intent that he wouldn't have signed had he known the the facts surrounding this it completely misrepresented the readiness of the sites at least the sites that we know that are within our jurisdiction I don't know about anyone else's accounting but to me that's fraud just put on whatever you need on the application so you get the money don't worry about it we'll fix it later well, I don't know about how Alameda County works or how Alameda County Sheriff's Department works but that's not how the city of San Jose works we have a waiver for the 700 megahertz spectrum that was signed by Sheriff Ahern without any authority that we know of in fact we've asked many times just show us where the authority came from and we get absolutely nothing we don't even get the sheriff here so that we can ask him directly and I don't know about my colleagues but to me that's offensive just we'll go ahead and do it don't worry about it we have an RFP that we heard Mr. McCammon say that exceeded standards well I'd like to see what low standards those were because they don't even come close to the standards of the city of San Jose in fact we know that the RFI that went out on September 29th of 2009 specifically stated that the Bay Area will not award a long-term contract based on this RFI that's a quote directly out of the document yet a short time later on February 1st 2010 the UASI staff um, sent out an email to the responders that basically said yeah we were wrong it really was an RFP and we're gonna pick this person this company and we're gonna go ahead well I really like would like to know mr. McCammon can you come up and tell us what standards that you're talking about that this procurement exceeded those standards whose standards are you comparing those two because that was something that you said when you were here a moment ago I referenced the uh, Cal California Emergency Management Agency's audit of the process, and that was in a letter that they sent to the UASI related to their review of the procurement. Okay, and what standards did they cite in that letter? I I'm not sure what they were, but I'm just telling you what was in that. So are we allowed letter. to get that audit, or is that another thing we have to do a Freedom of Information Act request for? Well, first understand, I am not the Bay Area UASI, okay, and, and I'm not involved in any of the document requests or anything that you're doing well, related to you, that. But you read the document, right? Yes. Do you have the document in your office? I don't have office? it with me, but I I'm, can certainly get it for okay, you. Okay, you have yes. it in your office. Okay, no, so I don't have it in my well, office. Let me just, let me, I, can, I think I, we I, have that. Do we have it? We, okay. the, the document is an uh, audit that was initiated by the UASI general manager. Um, we have, by, uh, by separate action, had requested that there be a full audit based against uh, government procurement standards. Um, our approval authority member Teresa Reed was successful in having the approval authority approve a request for audit um, and that was confirmed at yesterday's UASI meeting for both pro for both pro programs project cornerstone and BTOP however what's concerning is though that the UASI general manager initiated an audit before the formal approval authority could add scope and um, standards to the to the audit investigation and so the validity of the audit report is unknown and um, probably would would be worthy of, of fuller questioning okay well I think that's important that we get to the bottom of that and just for the people who are watching on TV or on the internet I just want to make clear because it's in the documentation but I think it's important to note that there's key UASI management team members who developed the deal with Motorola who are actually former Motorola employees and I know we would never allow someone in our organization who had that kind of relationship to be involved in any process to spend money or to, to commit our agency I think it's important to note as the mayor indicated that two million dollars of our money has already been taken and taken away from us and I know none of us up here knew anything about it there's no formal records of any government entity ever voting on that particular issue it just sort of happened and now we're talking about 
many more millions of dollars that we're being asked to just trust and that it's going to get spent correctly. Well, I'm not anywhere close to being able to trust in numbers that big, specifically given what we have um, seen so far. I think that God, there's just so many things on this. It, it, it's kind of hard to narrow it down to a handful of things to to talk about. But I, I think that we, as an agency, as a city, cannot continue to let this continue on this path and watch this money get get spent in a way where there's no public scrutiny, where there's no document trail for the public to even go back and look at how things happen. I don't think it's wise for us to be in partnership with people who won't share information with us. Um, and I, I think, as I mentioned before, it's ludicrous that someone like us in the County of Santa Clara, who undoubtedly represent a huge number of residents that are affected by this project and can't even get our, our questions answered. For those of you who haven't read the letters um, from Dr. Smith, the county executive, uh, I, I think it's very enlightening to read those and see exactly um, what is and isn't being done. I, I wholeheartedly support the goal of the interoperable communications. I think it's something that not only we need here in San Jose um, for our first responders, but also for our residents throughout our city. And I think that it is one of the top priorities of our nation. But there is no way that I can support the approach that has been taken so far or do anything that would endorse this approach continuing in the future. I am really concerned about the UASI Approval Authority um, never voting on this uh, private partnership with Motorola the selection of the executive sponsor, the, division, the decision to shift the $6 million of UASI funds um, from three projects to this, um, and the fact that a grant went through without any vote. I know here in the city of San Jose, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but before any grants are applied for uh, in the city of San Jose, especially those that would have the impact of causing us to incur significant expenses in the future. Don't those all have to come before our council for approval? Generally, yes. Yeah. And to just to see this, whatever it is, organization, and I see several different variations of names in the document, to continue forward without any formal um, process is just wrong. And, and I'm not willing to sit here close my eyes and click my little red shoes together and say, I believe, I believe that this is going to work because it's not going to happen. So with that, uh, I'd like to make a move, uh, make a motion for approval of the, the recommendations in the memorandum um, that is dated December 10th from staff. All right, we have a motion to approve the staff recommendations. Council Member Licardo. Thank you. Um, Michelle, uh, just so I understand, I know there are a lot of numbers thrown around about what this could cost us. If, if we assume, as I think many of us do, that this ends up becoming an opportunity for a sole source contract from Motorola for, for technology in the future, I know we've got a $50 million contract in this case. What's the magnitude of value of this effort to Mo Motorola? Well, if you're looking just at the handheld devices, which is where San Jose already has a relationship with Motorola in the, um, in the police department, um, as Chris mentioned, uh, as Chief Moore mentioned, it's, um, it's $5,000 roughly per device. The grant application, if you talk about the Bay Area region, talks about 50,000 subscribers. So that's, you know, the various public safety personnel, the first responders from throughout the Bay Area, and other individuals. Somewhere in a magnitude of $1 per device to 5000 per device, you know, we'll come up with a price, um, and someone, whether it's Motorola or another vendor, will be selling those devices to um, local jurisdictions. Um, so That's probably north of $100 million. 
Yeah, and then there's another piece of it where um, the public access side of the um, equation, which we haven't even really talked about, where um, somebody stands to make money off of selling broadband public access, you know, kind of um, to the general public in the underserved regions and using these communications facilities to provide that service. So there's money to be made on that side as well. And several tens of millions more, I would imagine. I would imagine so. Uh, Mr. McCammon, forgive me, do you, do you mind coming to the microphone for just a moment? I wasn't clear. I know you indicated you don't work for UASI. Is your employer the Sheriff's Department? I'm trying to understand. No. I'm a contract employee with the East Bay Regional Communications System. Okay. And when Sheriff Ahern called the first regional governance meeting together, I was there, and it was requested by the group that I assist with the formation of the governance. I have no connections to the UASI directly. We're running a communication system for Alameda and Contra Costa County, or building one, excuse me. Right. So do you have any dealings at all with the RFP? No. None at all? No. I was not involved so, in that process. I was involved in the um, review process of the responses that were submitted, but I was not involved in the development of the RFP process at all. But you're RFI aware, or RFP, whatever you You're aware that it was UASI's management team that essentially developed the, the, the RFP? Yes, with input from people throughout the region. It wasn't just them. And the UASI management team facilitated the selection committees? Yes, there were representatives, and I think those are included in the staff report of the people throughout the region that were on that selection committee. And the UASI management team recommended selection of contractors? No, the, the selection team made a recommendation based on the interviews with the vendors that responded. Right. When this was posted on the UASI website, it said explicitly the management team will recommend the selection of contractors to the approval authority based on the rating of selection committees. So in fact, it was the management team, wasn't it? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. I, I can tell you my involvement was to be part of the selection team. Our selection team made a recommendation, and how that recommendation was taken forward, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I'm not sure. Okay. So let's just assume for the sake of argument the OASI website accurately reflects the management team is the one that made the recommendations. Uh, were you aware at the time that four former Motorola employees sat, had jobs with UASI? Oh, well, we've all been aware of that for years, yes, that they had jobs with the UASI, that they had worked with Motorola. But again, I I'm not aware that they made a recommendation that was different than what the selection team made, and there were no members of the UASI staff that were on the selection team. The same selection teams, that committees, they, they in fact facilitated. They facilitated the process, yes, you're correct. Did it ever dawn on you that there might be a conflict of interest? On the process that I was involved in, there were at least four vendors that came in and made presentations to us, and I didn't believe there was a conflict at that time, based on my involvement. Even though the, the general manager of the OASI team had just been employed at Motorola, that never struck you as a conflict? Well, I mean, we're dealing with the people we're dealing with, but again, we had a process that those of us who participated in felt was um, a reasonable process where presentations were made by vendors. We rated those presentations, and we made a recommendation as a group. Was, was this RFP ever posted on the, the San Francisco BID website? I'm sorry, I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry I can't answer that because I'm not involved with UASI directly. So. What public entities voted to ratify the selection of Motorola? Um, I, I agree with your staff. There were no public entities that did. This was a grant that was moving forward, and there were no public entities that voted on it. So as we look at this letter of intent now going forward, it means I think you said that we would get a seat at the table to decide, and I'm hoping you can complete that sentence. What do we get to decide when we get a seat at this table? Well. We're all struggling as a region as to what this grant means, okay? I, I struggle with the same questions that your staff struggles with about the cost. Is it reasonable? Is this something that we can actually make work for the Bay Area? And we have to work through these issues with Motorola, who received the grant, to see if we even want to go forward. 
So what we're trying to do is assemble that team that's going to work on those issues. The first thing that needs to be done, there needs to be site assessments. Your staff made a uh, point that those sites were supposed to be shovel ready. Well, all of a sudden we find out now that those sites weren't shovel ready, that there are costs associated with upgrading those sites to make them work for this system. We need to understand as a region what those costs are. And that, that, I'm not here today to tell you that I would recommend that we go forward with this. What we're trying to do is do our due diligence to find out what all those costs are that go into making this system and see whether it's, it will work for the region. And the fact that those sites aren't shovel ready comes as a surprise to you now? It, it comes as, yes, it comes as a surprise to me. I was not involved in the selection of those sites, okay? I was not involved in the grant development process at all. As I mentioned, I'm coming in at the 11th hour at the request of a group of people that wanted to establish some governance on this. But I can, I'm, I, I'm concerned that sites were proposed that were supposed to be shovel ready that we're finding out aren't shovel ready. I'm in total agreement with your staff on these issues. I can empathize with how you feel about not having been involved in the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I, I guess I, I frankly feel bad for you because you're being put in this position to stand in front of us because Sheriff Ahern apparently lacked the courage to do so. And I'm sorry that you have to stand here. I think frankly that there's a message you should carry back to Sergeant er, Sheriff Ahern uh, and to GM Phillips is that uh, you know, in my seven years as a criminal prosecutor with the DA's office and the U.S. Attorney's office, I would have cleared my desk for a public corruption case like this one. I think this stinks, and I think folks ought to go get attorneys. So I hope that we can clean this up, and I hope we can do it in a very public way, and I'm hoping that we can do it in a collaborative way. But if we can't do it in a collaborative way, it will be public either way. Well, I, I'm telling you I'm here today committed to doing just that. And so, you know, I, I'm hoping that we can move forward with the city and try and put these pieces together and see whether it's beneficial for the region or not. Councilman Colra. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have too much more to add to what my colleagues said. I agree uh, with pretty much the sentiment we've already heard. And I just think uh, ultimately it's, it's sad because we did have, and, and hopefully there will still be an opportunity, uh, but we did have a really good opportunity here to create something that we definitely need, uh, especially uh, with the, the natural disaster risk that we have here in the Bay Area. Uh, there was a great opportunity to create this uh, mutual interoperability uh, for public safety communications in a way that was transparent above board and, and I know that um, Al the Alameda County representative indicating that uh, the goal is to assemble people interested and then determine the cost and I, and I don't disagree with that should be the way it's done but that should have been started a year ago when this money was first allocated there are plenty of opportunities going forward even in March when the mayor sent a letter and we were assured that information would be forthcoming that could have been another opportunity to say okay Thank you for continued support. Now let's all sit down and get together and determine how we move forward. And uh, I think it's just a shame because uh, we did put our trust into this and maybe we should be more cautious <laughs> in doing that next time. I think that it's kind of surprising and, and shocking to see other government agencies act in this way. So I, think, I don't think we could have anticipated um, this type of um, non-disclosure. But maybe we've learned through that and we'll be more cautious next time and, and not take assurances uh, when we put our name or the mayor puts his name behind something going forward and I think it makes us um, look bad and, and um, I, I think that's not fair to us as a city and I think that we certainly have standards that are far beyond what we've seen uh, through this process and so going forward uh, I, I appreciate the staff report and agree with it and I think we're still committed to creating this uh, regional communication system I think it's a good thing for us to do and, and we need to do it and I'm just hoping going forward we could do it in a way that, um, that, that at least reaches our expectations and our standards. Councilman Pyle. Thank you, Mayor. I agree with my colleagues that the fact that Sheriff Ahern is not here today is a huge red flag. I, I just can't believe that he wouldn't take this seriously enough to come down here. And the fact that the, the, the memo and the documentation strongly suggest that the process has been compromised. Some of the dollars have been spent. We don't know how many dollars have been spent. We don't know what they were spent for. Strongly uh, suggest there is no sunshine here. Uh, we, we need to be honorable partners. We are trying to do so. 
And so I have to ask Rick Doyle and or Chief Moore, um, the, is there enough evidence in the materials that we have before us today and the testimony to proceed with some kind of investigation? And or do you recommend doing so? Yes, there is, and I think we are. Uh, that's ongoing. So uh, the short answer is the yes, but as you can tell from the materials before you, there is a lot of information we don't have. And we've been, despite our efforts to get it, so absolutely um, we, we've got to uncover uh, all the details and then make recommendations on our next steps. But we do have the authority to bring the individuals that we need to bring forward here to answer those questions. Well, I think a, this is a legislative hearing. You've asked uh, the individuals to uh, appear. They've not appeared. Um, I think at this point we should continue to try to get the information and then we'll advise you accordingly. All right. And I would like to say too that there is far too much wiggle room in the process so that liberties can be taken in relation to getting the monies distributed. And because of this, I hope somewhere along the line that we do come up with some fairly airtight rules and regs for distribution of monies. This, the interoperability units are critical to the safety of the Bay Area. And the fact that this is happening and all of the use of those units will be delayed is really another crime in itself. So I would agree with the, the proposal and I'd like to push this forward as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you. Councilmember Herrera. Thank you, Mayor. It seems, and I totally agree with everything my colleagues ha have already said, it looks like the attitude in this project was the ends justify the means. And um, I think we've all heard, heard pretty, pretty clearly that, that uh, that's not acceptable, no matter how great the goal is. And I think this project, the idea of doing this has already been stated that it is very important um, na nationally as well as locally. So I, I hope that in the end um, we can come back and, and actually do the project, um, a new project the way it should have been done in the first place. Um, and Mr. McCain, looks like you said you you were brought in at the 11th hour, and that is what it looks like, um, and, and really kind of holding the bag. Um, and as everyone else has said, sh uh, I can't understand why Sheriff Ahern you know, is not here. So I strongly support our staff's position. I also want to thank the staff for the diligent work you have been doing to uncover the facts in this matter. Um, we haven't even been able to get, as it said, information on the fiscal impact of San Jose. Hopefully we know more now than, than we don't know, but I'm, I'm not totally sure of that. We definitely need to have the reallocation of funds. Where's our $2 million um, that should have been allocated to San Jose? Um, San Jose can't afford to lose $2 million. It, sh it should be coming to us. This deal basically just doesn't even doesn't pass the smell test, let alone meet our high standards. Um, and so I support uh, support this, and we'll be voting yes. Thank you. Well, much has been said about uh, Sheriff Ahern's absence, but under Sheriff Lucia is here, and I had a couple of questions that perhaps he uh, can answer since he also sits on the UASI board. And I, I'm curious as to why we have to have a governance discussion when we have a governance structure under the UASI board and why this couldn't be handled by the UASI uh, approval authority? The, um, the discussions within the approval authority have been uh, um, about governance, about whether, whether or not UASI was going to govern this grant. The grant itself was applied for by Motorola, not by UASI. Motorola was the recipient of the grant, not, not the UASI. It involves 10 Bay Area counties and over 100 cities and special districts. And those counties and special districts don't have representation on the UASI approval authority. The UASI approval authority represents, as you know, the three core cities and the three core counties. So if we're going to ask or if, if members of 100 plus cities and, and special districts are going to be asked to participate in something, the, the, the belief is that they should have some say in it, including the core cities and the core counties. So if you're going to pull together something that's got over 100 entities involved, there has to be a governance system in which they all have a say. 
and they don't have a say in the UASI approval authority. So by proposing a different model, which mimics to a certain extent uh, the uh, East Bay Regional Communication System, JPA, where everyone does have a say, um, the, the thought was is that it would be much more open, much more transparent, and it would be much easier for those entities that wanted to participate to know that they were involved in all the decision making right from the beginning in terms of the grant and how it moved forward so that if the agencies felt that the costs associated with going forward didn't make sense for them, they wouldn't have to do it. If a, if a majority of those agencies felt the same way, the project wouldn't go forward at all. It could still not go forward at all, whether San Jose or Santa Clara County or any other agency decides to become part of it or not. We would like to, to have a system that, that was truly interoperable. We believe that there's a definite need, just as you've all expressed, to have a system that's truly interoperable. How a lot of this occurred is, is not clear to me. But then I, people weren't calling me directly and asking me. I wasn't, as it was pointed out, I wasn't asked to vote as a member of the approval authority on this issue. So the, the specifics as to how this occurred, uh, re, I suppose, depends on, on who it is that you're asking. Um, but I can tell you that, the, that, that, the, that our intent all along has been to help facilitate the creation of a true governance model where everybody has input, where there are no secrets, where no one has to wonder how much something costs. But you can't get there until you sit down and start talking to the people who control the grant. And that would be, in this case, the NTIA and Motorola. So when, when, if you want answers to how much something's going to cost, you've got to ask the vendor who's charging what the cost is. And for one person to ask that and get an answer, I'm not sure that that's going to satisfy the other 99. So all 100 agencies need to be involved in this, as, as far as I'm concerned. You're a member of the uh, Bay Area UOC Approval Authority Board. Uh, do you know why this wasn't presented to the Approval Authority for consideration, say, on March 18th? And why, since March 18th, the Approval Authority hasn't been engaged in this? I can, I can, I can speculate. Nobody called me up and said, here's why it didn't go there. I can tell you that uh, the why is because the general manager made the decision to do what she was doing based upon, I suppose, what she believed she had the authority to do. Do you think that uh, the Bay Area Uwasi could have handled this organizational work that now the sheriff is doing if you accept your premise that we need to get 100 cities and counties engaged in this? Is there's some reason why the Bay Area Approval Authority couldn't have managed that process instead of having uh, Sheriff Ahern do it? I absolutely believe that we could not have managed that process. Nor, nor does Sheriff Ahern believe that he can all by himself manage that process. And that's why the work is moving, is, we're trying to move forward to create a, government, a governance system that can manage 100 plus agencies. The, the, the volunteers on the UASI Approval Authority, including me, who volunteer our time to these regional efforts, in spite of the fact that we have other pressing jobs to do, as all of you do, I'm sure, we cannot manage a 100-plus entity broadband system. No, the answer is no, we could not do it, my opinion. The other members of the Approval Authority may feel differently. That's my opinion. Well, as a member of the Approval Authority Board, uh, are you a little bit concerned about what happened to the $6 million that was entrusted to the Approval Authority of, of federal funding? Yes, I am, and I have some solutions for that that would have been, would have been voted on yesterday, but unfortunately, uh, through uh, no fault of my own, the meeting was uh, adjourned because a member of the Santa Clara County, uh, one of our members, had to leave. Otherwise, uh, we, we, I was prepared to stay there all day. Well, I, I think that would have been a good thing to do. Do you know why the Approval Authority Board didn't meet between March 18th and September? I don't call those meetings, sir, so no, I don't. Okay. Councilman Ricardo? Sir, so I was just curious. 
You said that the Southern entity was formed because of a desire to, to do outreach with the other 100 cities and counties and incorporate them in the process. So what outreach has been conducted in those 100 cities and counties to date? We've, had, we've held a number of meetings with what, what's called the technical groups that, uh, for, first of all, we're, we're looking at the cities and counties that control sites first, because without their, without their cooperation, there is no program. If the cities and counties that control sites all chose not to participate, which is certainly their right to do so, there wouldn't be a, a, a broadband project, because without the 193 plus sites, there's no interoperability. So the first, the first move is to, is to talk with the cities and counties that control sites to see if they're interested. And, and, and that has occurred. There's been two meetings already with representatives. There's been a representative from all 10 counties that has been, have been uh, invited to the meetings. We've also invited all the core cities and the core counties to the meetings to talk about moving forward to form a governance model that everyone will have a say in. So yes, there's already been two meetings of that that Sheriff Ahern has, has uh, called. And, and sitting on the Oasi board, you, you have, I know that you're aware that Alameda County has benefited quite a bit from Uwasi. As has uh, the other counties, uh, yes. Yes, but specifically Alameda County has obtained specific projects that are unique to Alameda County, it's fair to say, isn't it? I'm not sure that's fair to say. What would, what, what, well, what that's unique to Alameda County? Perhaps Deanna or Michelle have a particular help they can offer. Well, you know, we're aware that the Alameda County does receive funds for Urban Shield uh, off the top of the allocation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a regional exercise that includes uh, many other counties. Alameda County is just, we're just one participant. We are just one piece of that huge project that includes San Francisco County, Contra Costa County, Santa Clara County, San Mateo County. And Alameda County receives a disproportionate share of those funds. A disproportionate share? Absolutely not. Uh, I don't know, Chief, do you have to be Couldn't candid, notice. <laughs> the under sheriff, it's just that the, the money does go there. And to their credit, Urban Shield is, is an incredible program. It's just a, a large, significant fund. How much, if, if I may, I don't want to. Yeah. It's, a, it's a million dollars, and we do, not, we do not hold on to those funds. We actually use them to reimburse the cities and counties that participate. In so, Alameda County? No, not in Alameda County, throughout the region. This, this exercise last, this, a few months, a month ago, occurred in the city of San Francisco and the county of San Francisco, obviously one and the same, in uh, Contra Costa County, in San Mateo County, and in Alameda County. So it occurred in four counties. But it doesn't matter what county it occurs in, the participant agencies are the ones that are, that are uh, reimbursed. So if Santa Clara County wanted to put on six scenarios, they'd be reimbursed for all six scenarios. In Alameda County this year, I believe we had five out of 25. So Alameda County did not receive a disproportionate share of the money because we didn't, we didn't run a disproportionate number of scenarios. And it's not about making money, it's about training first responders for the kinds of events that they have to face. So the million dollars is not a check to the Alameda County Sheriff's Office to do with as we please. The million dollars is to pay for a regional exercise that costs, quite frankly, m way more than a million dollars. Oh, yeah. oh yes, thank you. Um, sir, could you tell us why your boss isn't here? I can't speak for him. I'm speaking on his behalf. I'm his appointee. He asked me to, hear, to be here, and so therefore I am here. Okay. Could you share with him our great displeasure with his lack of presence? Certainly. Thank you. Mr. Sheriff, uh, have you been involved with uh, conversations, phone or personal, personal meetings with either NTIA or FCC? Have I had personal conversations? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, I, I, I was on a conference call uh, with the NTIA recently um, when we asked them specifically about this deadline that they that they were that they were asking us to uh, tr to impose. Um, so I, yes, I was on a conference call with them. Well, I'm curious as to 
in that conference call if they had any uh, discussion about the letters of support that have been received. I mentioned a letter that I wrote earlier uh, that is based on this being a Bay Area UASI project and whether or not that was an issue that they raised in, in those conversations. No, they did not. Um, I will tell you that the, the conference call was something that, that I asked for. So, uh, you know, we, it wasn't th at, their, um, at their option. I, I, I wanted to make sure before we put any letters out or anything in, in or if I, we appeared here, that the, that the NTIA's desire or almost demand that we get answers on who's in and who's out was actually coming directly from the, the highest levels of the NTIA. So we had that conversation and I was, I was told, yes, in fact, that that is their, their desire, that they want to know which cities, which special districts, which counties have an interest in moving forward because if there aren't enough, the NTIA is not going to be interested in continuing this grant opportunity. So, and I don't blame them. If it doesn't, if it doesn't benefit the region, they shouldn't continue this grant opportunity. Uh, and that's what the conversation was about, sir. So it was not, a, they, they didn't initiate it to talk about any other issues. I, I, per, I more or less initiated it to just to be clear on that issue. As a, an approval authority uh, board member, are, are you concerned about uh, my statement that my letter was gained under false pretenses by the Bay Area UIC staff that works for the approval authority? and that there are 29 or 30 other letters of support that uh, may have been uh, gained on false uh, representations by the staff? Absolutely. I am concerned about that. Well, I would uh, draw your attention to the uh, letter from Senator Feinstein. Uh, I'm a little bit ticked off about having my signature on a letter under false pretenses, and my guess is she's probably not going to be very happy about supporting a Bay Area UASI application that turns out wasn't really a Bay Area UASI application. And, Mayor. Uh, yes, ma'am. Mayor Reed, I, I just have to put this in the record as well because attachment A, there is a letter that I signed that is in support of, uh, of the BTOP. And I need to say for, for the City Council that this was a UASI staff initiated letter. The, the form came from the UASI staff, Heather Tenenhill, I believe. And at that time, the, we were, I believe I signed that letter under false pretenses as well. Um, it does recommend a support of Motorola, but because it was initiated by UASI staff, we fully expected that this would be brought through the UASI. At the time, the letter did include references to having Alameda County Sheriff's Office as the fiscal agent. Because we preferred that the UASI maintain status of, as fiscal agent because of all the activity that we saw UASI staff engaged in, we deleted that reference out there because it was something that we could not support. And it says very clearly in here that we would be in agreement regarding the city's waiver for the 700 megahertz spectrum, that we would be in agreement to sign and enter into negotiations regarding the, the lease. But little did I know that at that time, um, and I no one still don't have full information, there was already activity underway to negotiate our, our lease away from the city of San Jose. So I need to put that in the record because there is document here that um, that needs to be further uh, put into context. Thank you. Councilor Constant. Thank you. My final comments is I really urge... Yeah. Under Sheriff, why don't you have a seat? Unless there are other questions, we'll call you back. I, I really urge um, all my colleagues as we run into our congressional delegation, as we often do at many events throughout the city, that we each individually express our displeasure um, with not only what's happening here locally, but with the way the governmental agencies are pushing this forward without the accountability. We know that clearly um, President Obama, his administration, and the Congress was very clear on what they expected with stimulus funds and transparency and accountability and um, uh, made it very clear that they would want to investigate abuses and I think it's our responsibility as individual electeds and also our responsibility as a city to make sure our delegation knows officially. But I think sometimes our individual contacts have a lot more influence uh, with the, the delegation. And I know we each know them and speak with them frequently. And I, I hope you can all join me in making sure that message gets loud and clear to our congressional delegation. Councilor McPyle. Actually, my, my points have been covered. Thank you. 
right, I have no cards from the public to speak on this, correct? That's correct. Any further council discussion? We do have a motion on the floor made by Councilmember Constant. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None opposed. That's approved. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McCammon, Chair Fuchia, for coming down to try to answer our questions. We appreciate that.